So let's get into to our topic, which is uh, chapter 24, the goal of specialness. This is, uh, actually 24 is a, a sort of a good summary of a lot of other stuff that's going on uh, throughout the course. The course is, has this redundant system to it, whereby it keeps talking about the same ideas, but in different ways. So today we're going to be talking specifically about Specialness. Let me lay this aside a second. And I want to start off, I want to say something first of all about what's happened uh, this last uh, few days with uh, the terrorist bombing in, in Paris. And actually I'd like to start with a quote from a, a famous Parisian. Uh, his name is Voltaire, whom I'm sure that many of you know, the philosopher, who said, Opinion causes more trouble on this little earth than plagues or earthquakes. So opinion causes more trouble on this earth, or belief systems, or ideas create more trouble. What this chapter that we're going to be studying this afternoon is about is about the idea of specialness. So is it somehow another I'm special, you're special, we're special, our group is special, uh, and there's a whole variety of ways that we can understand ourselves as being special. We're, we'll look at the two major ways, the two extremely major, different major ways are, one, you're special because you are hot. I mean, you just really, you got something that the other, other folks on this planet don't have. You're a VIP. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and the and the other uh, extreme that's down here on the other side is that you're special because you are not hot. Uh, you have all kinds of problems and difficulties, and the world is dumped on you, and the world, with regularity, dumps on you. You are. I've often said that I think one of the most important lessons you can get in the Course in Miracles is lesson 31, which is I am not a victim of the world I see, because the Course in Miracles is about being responsible. So if we can really get that I am not a victim of the world I see, we're really going a long, long ways in terms of understanding this whole, this whole course. So we got the booklets. Um, so let's, we'll, we'll just dive right in to the first page, and I'll start reading. Actually, I want to start with... Uh, one of my favorite uh, quotes from one of my favorite poets, Emily Dickinson, which relates to our topic today. It says, I'm nobody, who are you? Are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us, don't tell. They'd banish us, you know. How boring to be somebody. How public, like a frog, to say your name the whole day long to some admiring bog. So the problem is, in terms of the Course in Miracles, let's, let's read that, that first introduction piece there. Forget not that the motivation for this Course is the attainment and the keeping of a state of peace. So the foundation, which was set up to publish A Course in Miracles, it originally was called the Paris Century Foundation, but they changed the name to the Foundation for Inner Peace. Because this whole study is about attaining to inner peace. Can you imagine that there's anything <laughs> literally on earth that you would want more than to simply have a state of inner peace? Right? Going on with this, given this state, the mind is quiet and the condition in which God is remembered is attained. It is not necessary to tell him what to do. That would be what we call arrogance. <laughs> that would be just plain uh, foolishness. What we're really learning to do is learning how to listen. 
He will not fail. How could God fail, right? Where he can enter, there he is already. So God's already there. So this is a course in mind training. And some of the fundamentalists, uh, when they criticize the Course in Miracles, you can find this online. Uh, it'll say, this is stuff about brainwashing. It's true. <laughs> it is about brainwashing because our minds are dirty. Now, I don't mean that in some sort of pornographic way. <laughs> I just mean that they are polluted with all kinds of junk, worries, thoughts about the world, <clears throat> anxieties which dominate about money or health or personal relationships that we got going on with other, there's always something going on. We can never get to this kind of completely quiet place where you can just be. Evelyn Underhill, who was really one of my, when I used to teach college courses on mysticism, I, her book was the one I used, which is called Mysticism. This is a little quote from her. She says, she describes her early childhood mysticism as abrupt experiences of the peaceful, undifferentiated plane of reality like the still desert of the mystics. Now, when she talks about the still desert of the mystics, this is a very common phrase. Meister Eckhart talked about the still desert, the quietness of the, the emptiness. St. Teresa of Avila also used that same kind of terminology. The barren Godhead, the place of absolute... See, the point is, this is major, and you all, I, know, I know you already know a lot of this, that our major problem is that we're projectors. So we're making up this world that we see. It's reflected, in, there's a line earlier in the course where it says projection is a mirror, not a fact. That's sort of in it. It's a mirror. It's, it's, now, again, that doesn't mean that you are literally, physically creating this wall behind me or this podium or me or anything else, but we do create all of our interpretations, all of our analysis, all of our judgments, all of our all of our pretties and all of our uglies and all of our nices and all of our not nices. In other words, all of this stuff that we then put on top of whatever it is that we're seeing, which keeps us from being able to see. It says that more than once in the Course, right? We've actually, when you study the mystics, I mean, we say somebody like Jesus and Buddha and Mohammed. Jesus, Buddha, and Mohammed, all three before they began any kind of ministry in their lives, they spent these very long periods of time in quiet. Buddha spends seven years sitting under the Bodhi tree, right? Before he gets his, he wakes up, he has an, an enlightenment. And what is an enlightenment is that he, <laughs> he says he's now awake. It, it says immediately, and when he finally has this experience, and he comes back to the deer park at Benares, and he finds his old disciples, and they, they immediately say, there's something different about you. What, what's different? And he says, well, I'm awake. It didn't mean, he didn't say he was alive, he's just awake. Jesus' whole ministry, there's not an, any ministry at all until after the 40 days and the 40 nights in the wilderness. So that period of being quiet, going really, really, really deep within, and finding an answer which is not found in the world. There's, there's, because the world doesn't have any answers. None, nothing of the standard brand form. I mean, the world's got a lot of answers. But they're all illusory answers. The only answer that we can really get to that's going to be meaningful is the one that comes to us from God, who is also trying to speak to us. As all of the course says, Lesson uh, 49, God's voice speaks to me all through the day. So there's never a moment in which the communication is not occurring. The question is, can we hear it? And, and we can't hear it. And the reason we can't hear it is because we've got all this other 
anxiety and worries and thoughts about the world that are what the Course in Miracles refers to as dreaming. So we're, we're, dreaming, we're dreaming the world, and it's all just a dream. All of it is a dream, from which, at some point, we will, like the Buddha, awaken. And what you see when you awaken is that it was all just a dream. You, you thought all this stuff was so important and real and or special, that you know that you were you had a special role to play within the context of this dream. <clears throat> but that's all it was, it was just a dream. There's nothing, literally nothing more than that. Ken Wapnick once said that that the ego's idea of heaven is that it's a place where you get to keep your individuality. <laughs> right? So in other words, the, the, the ego's idea of heaven is that there's still going to be a you, like with a name and a personality and all the accoutrements that go with that. And the Course is saying, no, this is all going to, to disappear. Now that, that's a very scary idea for the ego. But the truth of the matter is that it's only by getting to that that then you can become, the difference, you've heard me say before, the difference between a mystic and an ordinary person is that the ordinary individual is a projector and a mystic is a receptor. Principle number seven of the 50 miracles principle says miracles are everyone's right, but purification is necessary first. So first we have to clean the slate. Let's, I think here, I love it when a prop is immediately available. <coughs> Will it stay there? Well, it's sort of immediately available. What do I need to do to make it stay? Oh, there it is. There it is. Okay. So this is actually what we want to get to. What we want to get to is an, a clean slate, an empty slate, right? We just want, we want to get to this place where there's there's nothing, because it's not till you get to nothing that you can find something. Because in the meantime, we keep, we keep thinking that, that there's plenty of something in the world. There's plenty of something on the news, there's a lot of activities that are going on, there's all kinds of things we can get interested in. And in this day and age, with YouTubes and everything else, there's more stuff than ever, the fascinating stuff to, to look out there in the world and, and to see. But that's, it's all a distraction. It's all on the outside. And Jesus, as we've said many times before, says the kingdom of heaven is inside you, obviously not your body, but within the mind. The problem is, is, is that our minds are, are cluttered, literally cluttered. You know, that's why uh, we may have trouble sleeping at night. <laughs> you know, the, the, there's too much stuff going on in the mind. The, the, the softest pillow, I think I said once before, there's a French saying, the, the, the softest pillow is a clear conscience. <laughs> you know, so it, in other words, that there's really nothing, there's no distractions, there's, there's nothing going on. Let's go to page two. I'm just reading from the Course now. Peace will be yours because it is His will. Can you believe a shadow can hold back the will that holds the universe secure? So what the Course is doing here, it's comparing the ego to a shadow. Now this is an interesting idea. Actually, look at this. See, this is it perfect how this gives me this illustration? So what we see here is just a sort of a, there's this shadow of a hand there, right? But that's all the ego is. I mean, all the ego, is, it has, it only lasts as long as it blocks out the light. And once it stops blocking out the light, then, you know, it's not there at all, right? And also, of course, it has no depth. It only has the, it's only two-dimensional, right? So it's really nothing. It, out, out, brief candle, life support player, this struts and frets its hour upon the stage. It's just like that, it goes out. We are so afraid of dying because we're so afraid of what happens when the, when the light goes out. 
And the truth of the matter is that the light cannot come on. <laughs> the, the big light, you know, the real, there, there's actually a part in this particular chapter toward the end of it where it talks about the magnificence of what becomes available to you once you're able to get it. Aldous Huxley once said, if you could get up your not self's light, you could be illumined. If you could stop anxiously cogitoing, you could give yourself a chance to be cogitoed. In other words, if you could stop anxiously thinking, you could have the experience of just being thought. Or another way to say it is just being, which is really what the mystics dis discover and says that, that they skip. Once that they, everything is cleaned out, once it's all done and empty, what do you have left? Excuse me. What you have left is being. Not individualized being, not a specific being, not a name being, but you have awareness. The awareness doesn't go away. That's why I've said in the past, I think probably the most interesting thing that happens to us when we die, that the first thing that happens is that you go, I'm still here. <laughs> I, not in some sort of physical sense, but the mind is still here because the mind can't go away because the mind, by definition, is something which is eternal. So we're just kind of being reintroduced to ourselves in a way. We just, we just, but we can't see it. We can't see it as long as we're we're trapped within the context of some dream or an illusion that really looks like it's real. And, and the more we get into it, the more, re, the more drama you got going on, the most, more soap opera you got going on in your life, the more Kadarshian your life is, you know, whatever, whatever it is, you know, then the more real it looks like it really is. And those, these, of course, are, are really our dreams, right? <clears throat> Let's look at the bottom of two. Let's read the passage there. To learn this course requires willingness to question every value that you hold. Every value. Now this is one of the, this is where it starts to getting difficult in terms of, say, traditional religion, looking at this sort of thing, right? <clears throat> Not one can be kept hidden and obscure, but it will for jeopardize your learning. No belief is neutral. No belief is neutral. Everyone, every belief, has the power to dictate each decision you make. Now this again is one of the major emphasis that Ken made over and over and over again when it comes to studying the Course is really raising the question, who is the decision maker? <clears throat> who's, who's deciding <clears throat> which way to go? And is it this insane mind that's running the show? And it often looks like it is the same mind, insane mind that's running the show. What happened in Paris this week, we could, that that's it's insa insanity, which is asserting itself within the context of the world, which then drives the rest of us insane as well. We get into it. Let me finish this paragraph, or this section. For a decision is a conclusion based on everything that you believe. It is the outcome of belief and follows as surely as does suffering follow guilt and freedom sinlessness. Now let's go to, to the top of five and let's talk about selfishness, separation, specialness, sin, sadness, <laughs> self-fulfillment, and spirit. But let's start off with the top line first. <clears throat> And a quote from the Course which says, Selfishness is of the ego, but self-fullness is of spirit, because that's how God created it. So, let's talk about selfishness uh, to start with. So one of the major questions that comes up every time you do a presentation on the Course, especially if I'm doing a presentation someplace new, and there's new people new people to the course that are, that are there. Someone will always ask the question, how did this whole thing get started in the first place? I mean, how did this whole insane 
world get going in the first place? And in the past, I've always answered that in terms of, I said, well, you can't really fully, I can give you an answer, but you may not be happy with the answer. Uh, certainly, it comes out of arrogance. But I think there's a better word than arrogance. Uh, that word we can use is selfishness, right? So selfishness is really a, a decision. It's a decision, I'm going to do it my way. As I've said in the past, the theme song of the ego is I'll do it my way. Right? And I'll become a self-made man or a self-made woman or whatever it is. The, the problem of that is that self-made people are often very lonely. <laughs> right? Because ultimately what this is all, it's all about, it's all about sharing. And it, it's all about sharing on the, not physically, there's nothing wrong with sharing physically, but it's really about sharing on the level of mind, which is kind of fun because that's what we're doing. I mean, we're, we're talking about these concepts which we know can have a positive effect for us. Going on down to reading the next part from the Course on page 3. Miracles are teaching devices for demonstrating it is, a blessed, it is as blessed to give as to receive they simultaneously increase the strength of the giver and supply strength to the receiver. Now, I'm going to ask you for just a quick second, if you've got your booklet, <clears throat> to uh, jump over real, just for a second to the bottom of page 6. And, of course, I will not say anything about who this little note came from, but this was a, once upon a time, this appeared in an email to me, <clears throat> the bottom of 6. I need to just accept with equanimity the very sad and seemingly unacceptable but unavoidable fact that I am utterly alone in the world and nobody I know so far really cares whether I live or die. Now that was obviously written by somebody who's uh, not very happy and obviously isn't finding much fulfillment in the world, though I happen to know that this particular individual is a very actually creative individual there is just an opportunity to be able to express it. Whenever I hear that kind of a thing from someone, what I want to say is, well, give more. <laughs> you know, just give, 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 give. This is so important. This is the, exactly the opposite of selfishness, right? So selfishness means that I take. I make it mine. Possession is nine tenths of the law, right? But we're going to do this, completely reverse that. This is why the Course talks about a re, what we call for is a reversal in thinking. The whole world needs a reversal in thinking. From the concept that we're, it's not about taking or getting or having anything. It's about giving and giving, and giving, and giving. Now this doesn't, I'm not talking about materially or financially. We're really just talking about giving yourself in some sort of sense of immediacy and presence. And if, if, if you see a need, responding to the need. Being, a, being available. You know, not seeing problems. Not that the problems aren't there. There are plenty of problems there, but it's not that we're seeing the problem. We're really looking for a way to share the love. And the more, it, it, it really works. I mean, you all know that this works. You know that you, insofar as you've practiced this in your own life, the more love you give away, it really does happen. The more love is coming back your way. I once read a an article about happiness, and a research that some social psychologists had done on what really makes people happy. And the conclusion of that particular article, I think it was in Science of Mind magazine, that was that <clears throat> the happiest people on earth are the people who are sharing in loving relationships. It's, it's sharing, it's the sharing, right? You've heard many times we've said this line here, divine abstraction takes joy in sharing. And if you think, what, what do you really enjoy more than anything else? I mean, it really is the sharing. It's, it's really, the, whether it's what concepts that we're sharing or just 
however love is being manifest. It's giving it away. It always comes back. So if you're feeling, when somebody tells me that they're depressed, <laughs> you know, then the main cure for depression is to, to really get out there and start sharing with the world. Because otherwise, you're locking yourself into yourself. And that's just going to continue to make you even more miserable because then you think you will, that you are alone. So go back to uh, page three again. <clears throat> so selfishness, we could easily say that selfishness is kind of the problem. Uh, however, selfishness is manifest. So the selfishness can be manifest as arrogance. It can be manifest as hubris. It can be manifest as pride, or, or whatever way it, it is that we're manifest. People who steal are not really happy. <laughs> you couldn't possibly be happy. And, and even if you think that you've got something, what you got, along with whatever you may have gotten, materially speaking, and there's no way around this, you also got guilt. Uh, you got guilt because you know, even if, even if it's not a conscious, the Course is asking in this chapter to go really deep. I mean, it's, it's asking us to question all your values. And, and see, by the way, if, if there are not some things that you have, some prejudices, for example, that you have kind of pushed out that you don't, that you just don't want to look at. It's not to mean, it doesn't mean you have to entertain them, but Looking at them helps us to get rid of the shadow. And that's what a Jungian psychology was a lot about. You know, being willing to, to, to go in there and to look at the shadow. And, and when you do, <clears throat> you find out that it's really, it's really nothing. I mean, it's nothing to be frightened of. It's, it's keeping it buried that makes us frightened of it. All right? So <clears throat> selfishness inevitably presents a sense of separation. I just separated myself from whoever, whatever. If I took something, I took something from the whole. Let's say um, as a child, you cheated a game. You figure out a way you can cheat at a game, right? OK, you won the game. But now you've got to deal with the guilt. Because you know, maybe nobody else knows that you, you, you cheated, right? You know you cheated. So now who's, are you, are, you, are you happy that you won the game or are you miserable because you cheated in order to win the game? It's much better to lose. <laughs> <laughs> because then we're not taking anything away from the whole, there is this thing that, that, that we call wholeness, or the Course of Miracles, the oneness. The whole mind, or the one mind. So if I do something that's separated or selfish, that's breaking away from the whole mind, from the one mind, there's just one, this is, there's just this one thing here. There's just one part of it. But I'm trying to steal a little piece of it. And so far as I've tried to steal a little piece of it, I make that little piece of it mine, Individuality is the problem in this particular case, right? It's sort of the individuality is the opposite. Now, that doesn't mean that you know that you're not an individual and you don't have individual characteristics, etc. But it's making something out of those individual characteristics that's not there. Of course, we have differences in in looks and occupations and and whatever we do in the world, but it doesn't make any difference what you do in the world. The only question is whether you're not you're happy doing what you're doing, or whether you feel like you're giving something to the world through what it is that you do, and therefore we're also receiving. So selfishness gives us a sense of separation. Separation is the problem in the Course. We have separated ourselves from the big one, <laughs> from the big G, you know, from, from, from home, from God, from eternity whatever words that we want to, and, and try, we're trying to live on that. 
and everybody knows that that is actually, actually everybody knows that that's going to die. That will come to an end because all bodies die. And bodies are the primary ways in which we think of ourselves as being separate or isolated from each other. Again, minds can join, bodies cannot. But we can join on the level of mind, which is really a, a very nice, that's part of what happens when we fall in love. We start we're giving to the one mind, and, and we get great joy in that. So selfishness creates a sense of specialness, and specialness and, and separation leads us to the sense of, of sadness. Or again, another word that I could use is uh, depression, right? Now, I threw something on page four. This is something we said that there's a, whole, there's, another, there's a generation now that are called them the millennials. And they sometimes have been referred to as a self-absorbed generation, the current generation of young folks. Uh, we have it manifest in selfies. Uh, we have it manifest in uh, Facebook, uh, et cetera. And I just listed this because I just wanted to put, point out that there's nothing wrong here. <laughs> this isn't a problem. Things have not changed. There was Generation X and Generation Y who had the same characteristics, right? And you notice this, this kind of fun quote from Socrates. Some of you probably heard this before, but I'll read it. The children now love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect for elders, and they love to chatter in, places, in place of exercise. Socrates, around about 400 BC. <laughs> so nothing's different. <laughs> Nothing has changed. Nothing does change, except that hopefully we change because we grow up and we, we mature. And we realize that, uh, I, I don't remember it, but my mom says that when I was 15, I knew everything that there was to be known. Now, I don't remember that, but uh, <laughs> right? it's, a, it's a disease of being 15, I think. Right? <laughs> right. But also notice with, with the tragedies that are going on, with the shootings that happen in the schools, et cetera, with the, what happened in Paris. Who, who, these are young men on the whole, right? Young men who have somehow or another decided that uh, they have been broken off, and they want, and the, there's a great need to attack back, to even get some sort of a identity via attacking back, right? One of the pro cl classic examples of that that we can, many of us remember, John Lennon and uh, David, uh, Mark David Chapman here in New York City back in 19. 80, because we, here we had John Lennon, who was a somebody, gets assassinated by somebody who thought of himself as being a nobody. So the way, the way that he could become somebody was to kill somebody. <clears throat> and actually, he said that one of the reasons he did it, because John Lennon had said that the Beatles were now more famous than Jesus. And he was sort of a, a little bit of a Christian fundamentalist, so that, would, that struck him as being something that Lenin shouldn't have said. Right. Actually, I spent a half a day with John Lennon and Yoko and three other friends back in 1969 at uh, <clears throat> his producer's home in Riverdale. His name was King. And I remember thinking at the time, it was just a few hours, but with that same idea, that John just struck me as a regular human being. <laughs> because we're all regular human beings. You know, we're just all people. I thought, let me tell you this story. I may have told this story before. I was, I was, several years ago, I was out at dinner one night with a friend. And there was a couple 
at another table sitting over. <clears throat> and you know, sometimes you can't help but hear the conversation at the other table. And it was about, it was a man and a woman. <clears throat> I, I think they were obviously an older couple. And the uh, husband had had a revelatory experience that day. And he wanted to tell his wife about his revelation. He said, honey, you know what? I had a revelation today. You know what? We're all just people here. And she said, do you think we ought to wallpaper or paint the bathroom? <laughs> and he said, no, honey, listen, you didn't hear me. Uh, you know, I had this revelation. You know, we're, we're all just people here. And she said, do you think it should be blue or yellow? <laughs> he said, no, listen to me. We're all just people here. Well, that's kind of the message of the Course. You know, we're all just, we're all just people here. And some, that's the whole thing about specialness is, you know, if you, if, if you think that somehow or another you're, you're better than somebody else is, or, you, or the other extreme, if you're, you're worse than somebody else is, God has no favorite children. So we're absolutely all, absolutely all, and it's not till we get to the point of seeing that we're all absolutely all the same, that it enables us to relate to each other straight across, which is very, very helpful. I mean, eyeball to eyeball, so to speak, right? Which is where we want to be able to, to relate to each other. We're not looking up. You know, Jesus in the Course in Miracles, there's no difference between me, you and me except in time. And seeing how there's no time, <laughs> there's no difference at all. We see a difference. We put Jesus upon some sort of a pedestal, or more likely on a cross, you know, which we then, uh, the church gets all caught up, up in, in, in worshiping. This is one of the places where traditional fundamentalists have a lot of trouble with the Course in Miracles, because Jesus, in terms of the Course in Miracles, is our, our elder brother. He's just exactly, we're all a part of the same mind. There's nothing which segregates or separates us or makes us any different from each other at all. But we don't know that. And we don't, we don't know that until we can come to that revelation or that realization ourselves. But in order to do that, we've got to wipe the slate clean. We've got to get rid of all of the idea of specialness, whatever, whatever that is. Now, let me talk a little bit more about being special. Maybe more of us know about specialness in terms of thinking that we're victims of the world, uh, rather than thinking, on the other hand, that we're uh, something that's really hot. I'm going to read the quote on the, near the bottom of five. <clears throat> to be sick and helpless is humiliating experience. Prolonged illness also carries the hazard of narcissistic self-absorption. So what we have here is that there's, there's a danger, I know somebody fits this category, there's, there's a danger of, I had a great aunt and a great uncle that I love very much, but you never wanted to ask them how they were. <laughs> because you would find out in living detail <laughs> the extent of the problems that were going on with this body that they, they we used to make jokes about it. Don't ask Uncle Lester and Aunt Jesse how they're doing, you know. <laughs> Just leave it. But sometimes you can't help it, but do it. And they really were actually very sweet people, right? But that's the whole idea, that they're the, no one is special. Let's go on to page six and look at some of the quotes from there. Specialness is the idea of sin made real. <clears throat> now, again, <clears throat> let's talk about what, what is sin. We've said before that you can equate the word sin and separation in the, um, in the Course, and they both mean the same thing. So if you're reading the Course and it says separation, substitute the word sin, see if it doesn't make sense. Or substitute the word sin for separation, or separation for sin, either way you want to go with it, it'll still make sense. 
It's the, it's the whole idea of brokenness. <clears throat> the whole, uh, whole idea of separation being that you've done something again against the whole. It's going against the whole that's the problem. So Jesus realizes that he, that he is a part of the whole. That's what the mystics do. The mystics realize when you get to this wonderful, blank, empty slate, you see that you're everything. I want to read you a description of an experience. Um, it's, it's in here on, a little bit further down, but I want to read it now. Um, this is a few a couple of years ago, last summer, uh, not this summer, but the one before. I led a, um, like the thing we're going to do in Costa Rica, except this was on a, a cruise to Alaska where we studied the Course in Miracles for a couple hours every day and then uh, tour it around at the rest of the time. So there was this lady on this cruise who was just absolutely delightful. She was a, um, she had been for two years of her life, she was a cook on a Mississippi tugboat which pushed barges up and down the Mississippi River. So that was her job every day. She had to fix three meals for the guys that ran this tugboat, and she had to keep the kitchen clean, and that was her job. So that's all she had to do was just feed them and keep the kitchen clean, all right? And one night, after she had cleaned up the kitchen from the evening meal, she goes back to her room, and she sits cross-legged on her bunk, and... I'm going to read to you on page 17 what she said happened. I was cooking for two years on an upper Mississippi towboat. One evening after I had finished my evening chores, I was sitting on my bunk in my cabin on the towboat. I looked around at the furniture in the room and realized none of it was solid but made up of molecules with space in between. I looked down at my hands and saw the cells broken down into the nucleus and all the spaciousness, and then I disappeared. I had no body, no boundary. I was everywhere and nowhere. I was aware of a peace that was so profound, I knew it had never been shaken and could and never could be without beginning or end. Now this is that the still, quiet piece. I mean, she just, you never know why these things are, she just slipped into this. I mean, it just, there was nothing that really, she wasn't meditating, doing yoga or anything. She was just relaxing at the end of the day in her, in her cabin on a towboat, right? And go on with this a little bit further. I also had an awareness of all knowledge. I knew all answers. I was also aware of the unity of myself with all people, animals, and plants, even to a blade of grass. Now, the Course in Miracles actually uses that analogy. It, talk, it talks about a blade of grass. You even see it in a, in a blade of grass, right? This seemed the most natural natural in quotes, parts of this experience. After reading A Course in Miracles, I realized that I experienced a holy instant. So when you listen to the mystics' descriptions of their experiences, we've talked about this here before, but one of the primary characteristics is this, this sense of, this noetic sense, this all-knowing sense. It's like when, when you see it, you see the whole thing. And, and you know you can't die because all there is is life. <laughs> and, and all there is is pure awareness. And you're already alive and you're already part of pure awareness. So what the Course is saying in this, this chapter is that we've got all of this junky <coughs> stuff that we put in the way of this awareness. By the way, we can't really talk about this. I mean, she, this is a pretty good description of, of her having slipped into it, but slipping into it also means that you slip into a place where there, there really are no words. There are no words because words are physical things. 
words, it's like wor words are concrete things. And, and we're moving past the concrete into pure mind. Yes, Laura. Well, we gotta have a, I'm sorry, but we gotta have a mic because of the, the YouTube. Um, what you're sharing with us is it, there's a movie that comes to mind that might help people understand this thought process. Has anybody seen the movie Lucy? She's the, she's the woman who uh, was a high tech, I think she was, she had these drugs inside her. And what happened was as these drugs uh, penetrated into her mind, she accessed more and more and more of her mind. Oh. And she became so profound that just a sip of champagne would mess with her, her system. And she just became more and more and more to the end of the, so the end of the movie is that she actually disappears and the statement says, they ask, where are you? She, her clothes are laying on the floor. And she says, I am everywhere on all the screens. So it, it didn't have the spiritual connotation necessarily, well, it but, does. but it does have yeah. um, a great depiction of, of what you're saying. That's the idea. You can hold on to that for the meantime. So that's the idea. The, that's, that's really, because without that, it's like we feel disenfranchised. We feel un unconnected. You get that, that existential angst that's, that's going on for most people most of the time. Nancy? Yeah. Can you just give us a quick, um, what's the difference between a holy instant and becoming enlightened? Well, essentially, it's because one's an instant. <laughs> I mean, and a holy instant is like a, a just, it's an insight. It, it's seeing it. It's being there for the moment, but we're not able to hold it. We're not able to, able to keep it. We're, so we, it, if you hold the holy instant, you it. are then enlightened. Yes, if, if you can okay. consistently be there. But, but you'd have to be, you have to be there with consistency. You know, and, and it's not, we probably, many of us in this room have probably had holy instances like this woman, where we've seen this, but we've also kind of, we lost it as well. I had this brief experience once where I kind of thought that I'd been <laughs> enlightened. And it lasted until I was talking to somebody who verbally attacked me. And it just started disappearing. It was like, oh my God, how easy I gave it away. <laughs> you know, how, they, how, how quickly that little ego thing jumped back in there. And and asserted itself. I didn't say anything, but like there was like, like this little defense that happened someplace inside the mind. It's just that little defense, even though there was no retaliation. It was, so it's, it's hard to hold, and, and be careful if somebody tells you they're enlightened. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it's not possible. Uh, it, it's, it's, of course it's possible, and we're all headed that way. But uh, to be able to hold on to it with consist to hold it consistently, that would be quite a challenge. And there, we know that there are some sad stories of, of those who we've thought were in that kind of a position who kind of hid the fact that they weren't in that position, right? So I wouldn't want to make any kind of claims like that. That's a very difficult thing to do. Unless you're really 100% there and you know it, and you're not going to, you know there's no danger of losing it. Actually, we're at our time for our first break. It's uh, 2.30. Let's take our 10-minute break. Mm -hmm.